Is the coronavirus going to kill us all and lead to the zombie apocalypse? I don't know. Depends on who you ask. But people are pretty concerned about it. At least some people are. And other people aren't concerned at all. People are funny. They're scared of some things that present no risk or hazard to them at all. And then they're not scared of things that really are a danger to them. And this disconnection between people's feelings of fear and the real objective threat that something poses is a real challenge for communication. In this video, I'm going to talk about how we communicate about risk. Hi, everybody. I'm Bruce Lambert from HowCommunicationWorks.com. This is a channel where I teach you about communication skills so you can improve your relationships, succeed at work, be more confident, and lead a more fulfilling life. As many of you know, my full-time job is to be a professor of health communication at Northwestern University, where I also direct the Center for Communication and Health. So it's with both a personal and a professional interest that I've been closely following the news about the 2019 coronavirus, which is infecting uh, tens of thousands of people in China and killing hundreds of people in China and now spreading to the rest of the world. The 2019 novel coronavirus is the technical name that people use for what people are calling the Wuhan virus or the Wuhan flu or just the coronavirus. I've been fascinated to read all the different ways that people communicate about the risk or lack of risk posed by the coronavirus. As a student of health communication, this is a real world example of how we communicate with the public about a potentially serious threat to our health. If there's some interest, I may make another video about the coronavirus itself, but this particular video is not about whether or not you should be afraid about the coronavirus. That would be a different kind of video. And I'm not a medical doctor, though I am uh, someone who is science literate and who has been reading and following the news. So I might be able to explain to people in terms that they can understand what risk I think the coronavirus presents. But instead of talking about the virus in particular, I want to talk about risk communication in general and to give you a basic framework for thinking about how we talk about risk. The framework I'm going to describe today was developed by Dr. Peter Sandman, who's a well-known risk communication expert and whose work I've been reading a lot in connection with the coronavirus and, and how to communicate about pandemic diseases. You can read more of what Dr. Sandman writes at his website, psandman.com, but I'm going to introduce the most basic idea from his way of thinking about risk communication. So the first observation that Dr. Sandman makes is that there are two components to risk, what he calls hazard and outrage. So hazard is what we might think of as the real objective threat. That is, how dangerous is something really, scientifically, objectively? How much of a threat is it to human health? How much harm could the thing do you? That's the hazard, the real objective threat according to science. The other half of the risk equation is what he calls outrage. So this is how upset, how frightened does it make us? So hazard is the objective part, how much could it hurt us? And outrage is the emotional part, how scared, how upset are people about uh, the thought of this risk? So the fascinating thing from the point of view of human nature is that these two dimensions, hazard and outrage, the objective and the subjective parts of risk perception are barely correlated at all. So if you want to predict how scared people are going to be, you might think if people were rational, then objectively the biggest threats would be the things that scare people the most. But that's not how it is at all. In terms of correlation, Sandman says that the correlation between perceptions of hazard and perceptions of outrage are only about 0.2, meaning that they only share about 4% of their variance. That is, people are scared about things that don't present any real threat to them, and people are not scared about things that present a real great threat to them. And we see this all over the place. So for example, someone might be afraid of electromagnetic radiation coming from the power lines behind their house. Very, very upset, very frightened by that. Even though there's very little objective risk associated with living near a power line. Or people might be very, very afraid of microplastic beads in the water or in their food or BPA additives in their plastic water bottles. And yet they smoke cigarettes and aren't upset about the threat that the cigarettes pose to them. There are so many examples. People are very, very frightened by air travel, even though air travel is objectively much, much safer than car travel, but people aren't very afraid of car travel. So over and over again, we see that people 
are not frightened by things that present large objective threats to them, and people are frightened by things that present very little objective threat to them. Now, occasionally, people are scared of things that present a real threat to them, and maybe that's the coronavirus case. So let's take this framework that Sandman gives us and think a little bit more carefully about it. So if we think about it, there's four possibilities. If we think of a, a two by two uh, table of uh, high and low hazard and high and low outrage. So let's think first about high hazard, low outrage. So this is where whatever it is we're talking about presents a real objective threat to human health, but people aren't worried about it. For me, a classic example of this in health communication is tanning beds. So people still use tanning beds. If you go and go to a tanning store and interview people about tanning beds, they're not really afraid of tanning beds. There's no public outrage about tanning beds. And yet there's very, very strong scientific evidence that tanning beds are very bad for your health, that tanning beds lead to the development of skin cancer, which is often deadly. So here you have an objectively high hazard and low outrage. The goal of health communication in this case is so the goal of health communication in this case is what Sandman calls precaution advocacy, which means we should be advocating for people to take precautions. So in the case of tanning beds, any health communication message should be designed to scare people a little bit so they will take adequate precautions in this case, so they'll stop using tanning beds. So that's our first case, high hazard, low outrage. The goal is precaution advocacy. We're basically trying to tell people, watch out, take some precautions. You're not worried enough about a real threat. The opposite example is low hazard, high outrage. So this is where we have something that scientifically and objectively doesn't present a very significant threat, but that people are very, very worried about. So examples here might be uh, vaccines, People are very, very frightened that vaccines might be harmful. The objective evidence is that vaccines are not that harmful, but people are very, very scared of vaccines, at least some people are. Other examples might include things like electromagnetic radiation from our cell phones. So sometimes people are very scared that, that, that the electromagnetic radiation will, will give us brain cancer or something like that. Another example of low hazard, high outrage might be concerns about certain kinds of foods and their association with heart disease, something like consumption of eggs or consumption of red meat. Now, you might not want to eat eggs or red meat for your own personal reasons, but the evidence that they're harmful to your health is very minimal. That is, there might be some small association between eating red meat and bad health outcomes or eating eggs and bad health outcomes, but they're tiny compared to things like exercise or smoking or alcohol consumption or something like that, where the effects are huge and detrimental and people aren't that upset. So in these situations of low hazard, high outrage, the essence of the message is calm down. Now this doesn't mean we should actually say to people calm down because that's just insulting to people to tell them to calm down. But the effect that you should be going for is to try to reduce people's outrage and to get them to understand that they have maybe overestimated the actual threat. This is what Sandman calls outrage management. The third category is one you don't have to communicate about at all. That's low hazard, low outrage. That's sort of everything's fine. There's no health communication challenge there, so there's nothing to talk about. And the fourth and final category of risk communication is high hazard, high outrage. So this is a situation where people are very frightened and the scientific objective threat to human health is real. So this is where I think coronavirus communication falls. People are very concerned about the coronavirus all around the world. It's uh, as of this writing, there's 30,000 or more official cases, about 685 deaths. There's more than 400 million people in China under some kind of more or less limited quarantine. The disease has spread to 10 or 20 countries. So there's a lot of concern. And in fact, coronavirus is a real threat to human health. How large a threat? is uncertain, but there's no question that almost a thousand people have died and thousands and thousands of others have been severely ill and hospitalized. So it's a real threat, it's not made up. The challenge as Sandman describes it in a high hazard, high outrage circumstance like this is what he calls crisis communication. And the essence of crisis communication, according to Sandman, is we'll get through this together. The dangers 
in crisis communication is that health communicators are afraid of scaring people. They're frightened that people are going to panic. They're frightened that they're going to scare uh, uh, stakeholders or constituents or voters that they don't want to scare and that people might over prepare or panic and they don't want to be responsible for that. So they're afraid of talking seriously about people's fears and acknowledging the reality of fear and maybe the legitimacy of people's fears. Related to this fear of fear is that health communicators, public servants, politicians, others are often tempted to over reassure people. They think it's their job to, to reassure mass audiences, to, to get them to just relax, to say it's not a threat. And you'll see some of this in the communication about the coronavirus. Basically people saying it's no worse than the flu. The flu kills many more people in the United States than the coronavirus has killed. That's true, but we're at the very beginning of this epidemic. The, the flu in the United States kills you know, tens of thousands of people. The coronavirus in the United States hasn't killed anyone yet, though it's killed hundreds of people in China. So as you hear people talking about the coronavirus and other health threats in the future, ask yourself, which quadrant does this situation fall into? Is it high hazard, low outrage, low hazard, high outrage, or high hazard, high outrage? And are they doing the right thing? Are they trying to calm us down? Are they trying to tell us to watch out and take precautions? Or are they trying to tell us that we'll get through this together? I think there's no perfect answer that even in something like the same situation, like the coronavirus situation, some audiences might not perceive any threat. So maybe for those, we need to tell them to watch out and take precautions. Other audiences might be really, really panicked and afraid to leave their homes or afraid to uh, interact with people who are Chinese or there's all these stories in the media of people won't eat Chinese food because they're afraid of the coronavirus. Maybe with those people, we need to help them calm down. And then in the middle, there might be people who are perceived high hazard and high outrage, and we need to talk about solidarity with them, that they need to take some precautions, but that we need to emphasize this message that we'll get through it together. So I found this basic framework for thinking about risk communication in terms of hazard and outrage and the different goals when you see different levels of hazard and outrage to be really helpful. And I hope you do too. So everybody, stay safe out there. Be afraid of the things you should be afraid of. Try not to be afraid of the things you shouldn't be afraid of and try to figure out the difference. If you like this kind of video, come on over to howcommunicationworks.com. Sign up for our email list and we'll send you a book about empathy. We appreciate the time you spend watching these videos. We know there's about a billion other videos you could be watching. We'll see you next time.